All right. I really want to thank uh, CTO for inviting me here, too. Um, I think the first time I came to a CTO meeting, I was just thrilled to see the breadth and the depth of the Canadian researchers and the kind of work that was being done in Canada and today as well. Hearing the kind of uh, research that's taking place, kind of trials taking place, but also the innovations taking place, and also the commitment, to, um, especially as you heard with Professor Truon there. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful. Sometimes I think, you know, we don't give our own people enough uh, recognition. So, kudos to everybody who's here and doing that important work. Um, because without you, the patients would be nowhere as well. But I'm delighted to be able to talk to you about, I think, what Don was raising, and which I think is very, very important. And that is, how do we actually make sure that patients are engaged, and why should we make sure that patients are okay? Other than it's just a good idea to do so, because they are the ones that are most affected. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, not just clinical trials, obviously, but patient involvement. Of, across the life cycle, and definitely with a rare disease lens, I think, as John has already opened up with. So just to give you a little bit of context on rare diseases and why it's so important to us in terms of the research, but also, I think, as Patrick says, the importance of the clinical trials, and that is that um, there are probably about 300 million people, maybe more or less, um, affected by some 7,000 rare diseases. 80% of these diseases are genetic. Um, doesn't mean they're all inherited, but they are genetic um, mutation that may be spontaneous. They may also be inherited, obviously. Ab about two-thirds of them affect children, and about 30% uh, of those children will die before the age of five years old. Out of these 7,000 rare diseases, only 5% actually have a treatment. So we got a long ways to go yet. And if you don't get into a clinical trial in many cases, by the time that therapy does come, you've missed it. So it's so important for us not only to have the clinical trials, but have them available to our patients. So this is just me kind of giving you a little bit of a notion of my thoughts around what a patient advocate is and why patients partner. I mean, I think for the most part, we think about patients, and I call them barbarians at the gates. For many years, we're standing outside the gates, kind of beaten in, trying to get our voices heard. Um, and, but as we know, uh, you know, if you're loud enough and you're persistent enough, sometimes those doors open up. But, but you got to get inside the gates. Nothing gets done in terms of negotiations outside the gates. If you're good enough, you get asked to the table. I always say the first stage of being invited to the table is a little bit like beggars at the table. People kind of look at you if you've got two heads, you know, and you're not real sure what you're doing there, and they're not real sure what you're doing either, except that you've kind of made enough fuss that they invited you to the table. It takes a while to earn your place there and to be able to make a sense. And John talked about the alphabet soup. It takes us about two years to even figure out what all the initials stand for. But if you persist, and if you actually, you know, bring some value to it, then you become what I call more or less strange bedfellows. You don't really become partners. You kind of, you have an interest in me, I have an interest in you, and we're going to kind of, you know, share and swap those interests. We're not necessarily on the same side, but we know we need each other. But that's at least a first start, right? And it's a little bit more than just being the patient there, but you actually do bring something to the table. There's a trade-off here. We provide support in terms of how those clinical trials might go. For instance, what is the best way? How do you reach the patients? How do you get more patients? I'm constantly getting companies, researchers, and developers write to me and says, how do I find these patients? How do I find these patients? So I have some value to you. I'm hoping at the end of the day, you end up with some therapies. And as Dr. Truman says, those therapies are also affordable to us, but that's the trade-off. Then we get to the point where I call that magic spot where everybody wants a patient. Suddenly, patients are everywhere. Patients are being asked, patient-centered, patient-focused, patient-driven. It's everywhere that we want to have patients. In fact, I don't have enough patients to actually send to everything that we need to have a patient at. So that's kind of a, uh, of a challenge. Because in part, not only are you a, a patient, as I say, it takes a while to get trained up. It takes a while to be comfortable at the table. It takes a while to be knowledgeable enough. It takes a while to actually understand the policy and the environment in order to participate effectively. So patients, and we're talking about patients being engaged, but it isn't a patient. It's not just a patient off the street you're going to bring into the table and say, so tell me what you want and how we're going to do this. It takes a lot of stuff. And in many cases, these patients are patients, or these patients are parents. And guess what? They actually have to deal with their disease. They actually still have to deal with all of the other issues if they have another job. And then they also, if they're parents, they have to deal with parenting and a job. So these are people that are trying to do this while they're doing all the other things. So everybody wants a patient. We all think it's a good idea, but it isn't a magical solution, and it isn't that easy. An expert patient is not that easy now. We have great opportunities, though, and that's the important thing. 
And then we get to the last part where I talk about where sometimes uh, I think people fear we're going, and that is where the inmates start to run the asylum. So, you know, I don't think we're quite there yet, but uh, in some respects, I always say jokingly, when you think about how some of the asylums or even some of the hospitals are run, I don't think we could do a more, worse job. So not, not to be too... Uh, but why patients for... Uh, I'm not going to read it all to you. You can see it, why partner with patients. I mean, there's lots of reasons why. As you've already heard from Patrick, the engaged patient community really is able to provide you with an understanding of what the gaps are. And we know in many cases there have been drugs developed for which there is absolutely no need. And so you bring them to market, nobody wants them. Or they're too difficult to use. Or they have too many side effects that looked okay in clinical trials. But at the end of the day, when you got to real patients, they said, no, I don't think so. So I think that's important. Looking at what, you know, an engaged patient, family members provide that firsthand experience. And that's critically important in terms of understanding the diseases, but also, again, what's the tolerance? What's the necessity? Engaged patients have assured that the clinical trials meet the patient expectations. And I hopefully, and I certainly have heard today a lot that says, speaks to that, right? And then also then engaged patients assure that the um, products will meet patient needs. Um, Patient, I'll just give you some very quick examples here. So um, cystinosis is a serious disease, leads to kidney failure. The trouble was that the original drug had to be dosed six hours, every six hours, and it had a very strong odor to it. A trouble with dosing a drug every six hours for a child, right, is somebody has to get up in the middle of the night to dose that child. And if you send that child to school, you have no assurance that that drug is going to be administered. New therapy comes in, it's every 12 hours, and doesn't have the odor that the original cause is a slow metabolism. Challenge is trying to convince the reimbursers that this is actually a worthwhile drug because as they redo it, it has no greater efficacy. No, but it has tremendous quality of life benefits. Partner with patients in terms of clinical trials, the same must go just free, some of you know that. This was really important. First drug comes out, they say, no, it doesn't meet the standard in terms of improved outcomes, a six minute walk test. Hello, some of these kids are already in wheelchairs. What are we talking about here? And so they came up with their own measures to say, this is the indication in terms of whether the drug is actually working in terms of improved outcomes. But they have to go through a whole process of getting those outcomes actually validated. But that was important. And then the drug actually got a conditional approval in Europe, in the US. Uh, clinical trial questions addressed by patient engagement. I won't go into that because I think many of you know it. But it really does if, you know, help if we start with where's that patient? What are the best practices here? I uh, just want to give you another example here, uh, AKU patient partner for implementing a clinical trial. AKU Society, hosted by a father who has two children with AKU. This is also known as the black bone disease. It's a pretty awful disease. Um, there's no drugs, no therapies. He started a foundation to actually start to raise money. He was actually a, very much of a researcher, a capital, uh, uh, a, um, a fundraiser, as also a marketer raised the monies to actually get researchers interested, found a candidate drug, has funded now all the research, and now it's actually in phase two research, a phase two and a half clinical trials, and then set up a patient registry so that the researchers could quickly find all the patients, driven by a father who had a vision. So hopefully it's gonna be there. Okay, I guess I'm out of time, but I'll give you one quick thing here. A, a patient partner defined the patient values. This is something that I think is very important as well. Those of you who may know just, we have a life uh, raft uh, group here in, Ca in Canada as well. You know, they actually did some groundbreaking research on terms of what the benefits of Gleevec were. One of the important things they were able to demonstrate through setting up their patient network is that the side effects were not that onerous to patients. So we have researchers, we have the uh, the um, Regulators, even the reimbursers who said, oh my gosh, we shouldn't approve this drug because it's got too many side effects with the patients, it's intolerable. Patients stood up and said, no, we don't think so. We will handle those side effects in exchange for a life-saving therapy. So again, it's going back to the patients to make sure this happens. I won't belabor this, but if you want this slide, it's a wonderful slide. It took me a long time to kind of come through these. I love two by two slides, but it really talks about what are the different ways in which patients can be engaged as individuals, as organizations, as experts at the table, and then finally as what I feel is the penultimate, and that is the patients who are driving the research. That goes back to my AKU. It goes back to the muscular dystrophy, where we now begin to be a real partner in setting up those research trials and actually defining what the outcome measures are and even putting together the research consortiums.